If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors according to Indeed data and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. And Indeed doesn't just help you hire faster. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites according to a recent Indeed survey. With Indeed, everything hiring is all in one place and it makes it so easy. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences each each day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. The more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join the more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash podcast. Just go to Indeed.com slash podcast right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Terms and conditions apply. Indeed.com slash podcast. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Everyone in podcast listening land, I'm Karen Devaney and I'm Ann Barner and, and we're, we're sisters. sisters. Welcome to Sugar Coated Murder where we'll discuss and probably inappropriately laugh about and comment on yep, one of our favorite subjects, murder. murder. Oh, and we love to bake and why not combine our two favorite subjects, baking and killers. Hey, Ann Barner. Hey, Karen Devaney. How's it going? It's going okay. How you be? God, I feel like we're living in the rainy season. It does feel like we might have moved to Seattle or something. <laughs> it's crazy. it's raining every day. And when I got in my car to come over today, it was only 68 degrees. Oh, and see, you will not hear me complain about that. And then it warmed up to a balmy 71 by the time I got here. Yeah, I love it. Well, it's okay, but I can't, I really have been trying to figure out a day that I could go play hooky and go to the beach for the day. Oh, uh, yeah, that's not... And this. it's just not in the cards this week. Give because it a couple there's of weeks. either low temperatures or thunderstorms. Right. So I don't have, there's no break, so that's a little depressing because this would have been a perfect week for me to go play hooky and go to the beach. Right. So, I don't know. There'll be other weeks. I know. Don't give up. I won't give up, and I will play hooky, and I will go to the beach. <laughs> so, anyway... So, what are you baking today? Oh my goodness. I um, decided that we do a lot of sweets on here, yes, so I wanted do. something a little savory. Um, I love the Red Lobster cheddar biscuits. That mm. they, it's like the only thing at Red Lobster I can eat because, of course, I'm I allergic know. to seafood. So. Yes. And actually, there was a time when I wasn't allergic to seafood and I did enjoy the Red Lobster on occasion. So um, a lot of people like Red Lobster. Can I just say I've never been to a Red Lobster? Yeah, you can say that. Because I feel like Red Lobster is like a chain seafood thing. There's no way there's fresh local seafood going on in that Red Lobster. No, there's there's not. And um, you've lived a lot of your time in areas that have I've lived fresh on the coast a lot. Seafood, and, yeah. yeah. So if you're living in an area that doesn't really have that, Red Lobster's, you know, not bad. Um Anyway, they do make the mix now at the store, but I wanted to just try to make them homemade. Of course. So I found a recipe that kind of mimics, mimics oh, that recipe. Oh, look at us with the same word. I know. How about that? So that's what I'm making. I'm making the Red Lobster Cheddar Bay Biscuits. I am so excited because I never had them, so this will be a first for me. I think you're going to enjoy And them. I think I'm going to love them. Yeah. So, and nothing says loving like something from my sister's oven. <laughs> <laughs> So that's right. All right. While you're doing that, do you want to talk about the recipe at all? Yeah, you, I will. Okay. It's um, it actually is a really easy re recipe. Repacy. Repacy. <laughs> um, it's just flour, sugar, baking powder, garlic powder. This recipe calls for cayenne pepper, which I think is a little bit of a mistake because an, the Cheddar Bay biscuits at Red Lobster had Old Bay. I was saying. In so my head, I was saying. Mm. Um, the Old Bay. Yeah, I put Old Bay instead of the cayenne pepper, oh, butter good. milk, unsalted butter, and uh, sharp, sh sharp shredded cheddar cheese. Oh, that's a mouthful. It is a mouthful. Sharp shredded cheddar cheese. Yeah, so you do your dry <laughs> ingredients, and then you mix in your wet ingredients and fold in your cheese. Okay. And then there's like a 
the uh, topping that you brush on top with that old bay, some of the butter, oh. and some parsley. Ooh. Brush that on top, stick them in the oven, 450 for like 15 minutes, and you you're good to go. You're speaking my love language right yeah. now. Yeah, <laughs> you're good to go. You. <laughs> Especially on this rainy, overcast, chilly day. I know, so. I know. You just need to have like some, some soup. Oh, oh my God! You're so chili right. or Some something good to, go. Soup right. to go with it. That would be so yummy. I'll put you in charge of that. I was gonna say, can you just whip us up some homemade soup while you're in the kitchen? I know it seems like I could, but I literally packed <laughs> most of my kitchen, and yeah. I'm only leaving the things out that I know we'll need to do baking for our podcast. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I getting it. it's getting a little uh, crazy around her. A little cray cray. A little cray cray. All right, well, I have a murder to discuss. All oh, right. This murder happens in the late 2000. <laughs> in late 2000. Okay. And it happens in Raleigh, North Carolina. Okay. And I love Raleigh, North Carolina. Lived there more than once and really liked it. Went to college there. You went to college there for a minute. I did. And I went to college there for more than a minute. Yeah. So I really love Raleigh. Um, this story is about Eric Miller and Ann Miller. Oh, I know. But you picked a murder with a woman named Ann. Well, that's I, tacky. But she doesn't use the e. Oh, okay. Then you're so good. it's completely different. It's completely different. Yeah, a whole pl complete different person. <laughs> yeah. So they also had a little baby girl named Claire, Aww. which I do like. I do like that name, Claire. So, they actually were both graduate students in biochemistry from um, North Carolina State University. Go Wolfpack! Woo -hoo -hoo. And so, Ann worked as, as a chemist at GlaxoSmithKline okay. in Research Triangle Park. I nice. worked there for a while. I nice. understand how to get there from Raleigh. I know how to do it. I know how to get there. And then, um, Eric worked as a pediatric AIDS researcher. Um, and then as a scientist at UNC, I think it's called Lineberger or Lineberger Cancer Center. Okay. Um, he did research in pediatric cancer. All right. Okay. So, November 15th, 2000, Eric goes bowling with three of Ann's co-workers from GlaxoSmithKline. I, I'm, I like to bowl, but I am not good at it. Oh, I'm so bad at it, but I, I feel like in my mind, I look really good when I do it. Yeah, I can't even hold the ball with my fingers in the holes. Oh, I can do that part. Well, I probably couldn't now because I got a little bit of a hurt shoulder. Right. So I, I couldn't even, no, I wouldn't be able to even pick up a ball without it being. Like, yeah, I, I can't mean, hold just, anything in that hand. Help me out. If you're not going to put the bumpers up, just help me out because... <laughs> It's well, not going to go I anywhere. I do like the bowling alley atmosphere. Yes. I usually, they usually have good food. The beer and the cheese fries. Yes. Hello. I mean, that's also good. So, Eric was drinking beer. Oh, nice. He was drinking beer at the bowling alley. He and these three friends of, co-workers of Ann's that he was friends with, which I thought, you know, that's fun that when your husband becomes friends with your friends yeah. and your co-workers and stuff, yeah. that's fun. So, anyway... He's drinking beer, and he does make a statement that the beer did not taste good. Uh-oh. Yeah. So, everybody's drinking with him, so he's like, okay, it must just be me. They all keep drinking. And about an hour or so later, he becomes very ill, still at the bowling alley. Oh, man. He becomes so ill that his wife, Ann, drives him to Rex Hospital in Raleigh. I've been to Rex Hospital. Had me a little spinal tap in Rex Hospital. Right. Um, and he was admitted. Oh. Yeah. So, um, about six days later, he gets transferred to one of the hospitals at UNC Chapel Hill. Okay. Where they can run some more extensive tests. Yeah, because, yeah. To figure out what's, what's ailing him. What's ailing you, Eric? Eric? Yeah, could it, is it really just bad beer, or what's going on here? <laughs> that usually just gives you the toots. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> traces of arsenic in his body. Oh, no. I know. And there is a delay getting the results to Eric and the family and the doctors. But Why? Eric seems to show some improvement. Yeah. So on the 24th, he gets discharged from the hospital and goes home. He does not return to work, but he does go home. Interesting. So six days after that, on November 30th, he becomes sick again after dinner. Uh-oh. And Anne takes him back to Rex Hospital. 
So um, the next day, they did some new tests, and they came back showing dangerous levels of arsenic found. Oh, gosh. What the hell? What? I'm not... Uh... I'm not sure how I feel about Anne at this point. Yeah, Anne seems a little squirrely. <laughs> so, treatment begins, and a nurse that was concerned calls 911 oh my God. and talks to the police. Nobody panic. What happened? Apparently, oh no, I didn't. I washed it. I thought I had packed my pan to cook my biscuits on. There are no pans. But then I remembered I decided to run it through the dishwasher last night. And here it is, nice and clean, right? Fresh out Good of my thing, because you'd be unpacking all your boxes. Oh my to gosh, right now I don't know what I would have done. Yeah, we would have found out how well you labeled your boxes. <laughs> well, I did. I, they just say kitchen. Oh, that's dangerous. Okay, so back to me. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so, anyway, um, a nurse calls 911, and police come in and actually talk to Eric. He's lucid enough to have a conversation with them. Right. And he says he has no idea how he came into contact with arsenic. That that's not something that that's like at his work or anything that he would have. But surely asked he's thinking. Him. You know, he's not thinking. Really? Mm -hmm. Maybe that's because he's got arsenic in his brain. Maybe so. So on December second at two thirty in the morning, Eric succumbs to the poisoning and dies. Oh, no, that's Eric, how quick. That was fast. So police go to search the Miller home to find arsenic or some source of poisoning, and they find nothing. Right. Well, yeah. That makes sense. So on December 4th, the police go to GlaxoSmithKline, where Ann works, and they go to see what they can find, and they seize a bottle of, I had to actually get the pronunciation button to tell me how to say this. Oh. And it's cacodylate. Oh. Cacodylate along with two expense reports, a contract, a lab notebook, a computer, and a keyboard from Ann's desk. So, huh. I know. On December 6th, police searched the UNC intranet, <laughs> where, um, not the internet, but the internet, internal that. internet at, at the UNC Research Center, where Eric is, and they take two disks loaded with Eric's emails, his lab computer and his lab files. Okay. And so on December 19th, they also go back to the Miller home and take a laptop from the Miller house. Oh dear. So they're trying to look through all this stuff. Sure, yeah, you got what's it. Happening. So upon investigating all of these computer files, investigators discover that Ann Miller has more than a co worker relationship with one of her co workers. Oh man. His name is Daryl. Willard. Daryl. Daryl. And I hate the way he spells his name. Oh, no. It's D-A-R-R-I-L-L. -L. Like, yeah. that is the, that, I'm sorry, but that is like the least creative way. Like, that's the most, like, what a simple, I just don't <laughs> like the way they did that. Like, I like a more exotic spelling, like a D-A-R-Y-L. Like, right. But the D-A-R-R-I-L-L. -L. Daryl. Daryl. Yeah. And his last name's Willard. Mm. So, it's just hard because you do real will right next to each other. It's like, they could have yeah. come up with something better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, he might be one to have a, a nickname. Perhaps. Yeah. But I don't I don't know. His parents just, they, they, they weren't creative at all. Right. I guess they were trying to rhyme, but they, they didn't do it. Right. So, on January 21st, police go and visit. 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 See, see how it's throwing me off? I, I do. I visit do. Willard's home. And they take several documents and a couple of computers out of the home. He's married with children. Okay. And um, at this point, police announced that while Ann Miller is not considered a suspect at that time, Daryl Willard is now a person of interest. Uh-oh. So the next day, Willard's wife, I think her name is the vet. I didn't write down her name. I felt like she had enough to deal with. Right. So, um, she finds him dead of a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. Oh, no. Durl. Durl. He has offed himself. Durl. A note was discovered in which Willard apologizes to his family, but he declares his innocence in the poisoning death of Eric Miller. Oh, so I didn't, I didn't poison anybody, but I'm, I'm going to kill myself. And I'm real sorry, family. So sorry. So sorry. So, but... If we kind of rewind a little bit, back in November, just before that night that that um, Eric was 
out bowling. with the bowling people? Yes. Just before that, Ann and Daryl had gone on a, what they said to others was a business trip for Glaxo, but in investigating everything, it was actually a romantic tryst in Chicago. Oh, no. And it turns out that Daryl is Ann's supervisor at work. <gasps> Daryl. Scandalous. Scandal. Shame for yeah. shame. And, by the by, Daryl Willard was one of those three co-workers of Anne's that bowled with Eric that night. Oh, no, that's not looking good. And guess who was pouring the beer for Eric? No, 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 not Daryl. 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 Daryl, he was doing it. And Anne was there. Was she watching it? Well, she probably was telling him what to do. Oh, no. So, um, upon Willard's death, though, the investigation kind of stalls. Right. Because they are like, all right, well, he did it. Well, but they still, yeah, so it just kind of stalls because it's like, we need to keep an eye on things, but we really think this is who did it. Right. So, May 10th, a full autopsy report on Eric comes out and confirms that he was killed by arsenic poisoning. It reveals that Eric had been given at least two doses, high doses of arsenic, including one while he was actually in the hospital the second time. <gasps> oh, wow. There you go, Anne. Yes. And they also, it also connected that um, cacodylate, cacodylate compound that they seized from Ann. They, so that's a compound found in arsenic. It, it connected that compound to the arsenic. So now I'm starting to think, you know, hospitals need to have alarms on their machines where if anything is added, like you have to have a code to add I agree. something by I injection. I agree. Um, you're not allowed to bring in, you know, like there's a cup, one one drinking if your person can drink, that they can drink out of and that's it. Right. You know, I think it needs to be closely supervised. I think so too. Especially when you have somebody that's coming in with poison. With poison, yeah. So anyway, um, the arsenic was found in, in Eric's blood, liver, and urine. So he had some heavy doses yeah, of it. Yeah, he got it bad. So, six days later, a new toxicology report comes out, and it was more extensive. Okay. And this revealed that Eric had been given a substantial dose of poison several months before he got sick at the bowling alley. Oh, no. Yes. Yeah, so this has been ongoing. December of 2001, a local Raleigh church holds a vigil exactly one year from Eric's death. And family, friends, co-workers in the community gather because they still have questions about his death and want to keep the pressure on the authorities to continue pressing the investigation. So, meanwhile, Anne has stopped talking to the police. Right. She says, I ain't talking to y'all no more. I'm done. Donezo. So, and during the investigation into Durrell, police find out that he had actually gone and spoken with an attorney just before he killed himself. Oh. Right. So, in February of 2002, the Wake County District Attorney asked a judge to force Willard's attorney to disclose what they talked about. Yeah. Citing that attorney-client privilege only applies while the client is living. Oh, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. So. Interesting. Yes. Um, Willard's wife had told the DA that her husband's attorney had told him he could face some murder charges. So oh. he had at least disclosed to his wife. Right, what had happened. Yeah. And so in March of 2002, they're still trying to convince the judge. So they started trying to convince the judge in February. A month later, they're still trying. Right. And investigators at that time divulged to the judge the ro romantic relationship between Ann and Daryl that they had uncovered. So the judge orders Daryl's attorney to start talking, and the attorney appeals the order. Really? Yes. So, so the attorney doesn't want to give it up? He do not want to talk about it. No, because then it, that's bad for his I reputation. Get, I get it. I do. I get it. But, I mean, we're talking about solving a murder. I know, and the guy is dead. So anyway, and see, my thing is I would go to the wife and say, do you mind if I disclose what we talked sure. about? Sure, yeah. You know? And if she says, I don't care, you can tell him whatever he said. I don't give a crap because he's a low-down, cheating asshole. Right. Who killed himself and now got kids with no daddy, and he's a low-life asshole in the grave. Right. Yeah, so. And I'm sure that's exactly what she would have said. 
I'm thinking those are the exact words she would have used. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, anywho. Let's, let's hope that we have a good outcome. I'm waiting for it. I know you are. So August of 2003, the North Carolina State Supreme Court Ooh. rules. We got that, the big dogs in there. I know. Rules that Daryl's attorney must divulge to the judge. Spill the beans. And then the judge will have to decide if it has anything to do with right, whether the investigation. Not, sure. And well, if it's going to do anything to affect it. Right. Okay. And at that point, if he thinks it is, then he will divulge that information to the DA and the investigators. So, in October, this attorney meets and divulges to the judge, but the information remains sealed while the attorney appeals that ruling. Oh, my God. I mean, it's just dragging on. One thing after another. Yes. So, now we're in November of 2003. Whew. This man got sick in November of 2000. Now, that come is, on. Yeah, let's we need get closure. on with it. Ann Miller remarries. Of course she does. Yes, yeah, she marries some Christian rock guitarist named Paul Martin Conz. Mm, Paul, yeah. dude. I know. And? Hope you're a praying man. <laughs> yeah, Ann, her daughter, Paul, and his daughter all settle in Wilmington, North Carolina. Lovely. I love that area, but now she has sullied it. 2004, May. The attorney finally loses his final appeal. Oh, God. And so um, his client's notes are turned over to the DA and the investigation. And the information still remains, und was to remain undisclosed to the public at that time. Right. So he turns it all over. So they have it so they can use it to see, okay, what, we, what can we find? So in September, a Wake County grand jury hands down an indictment charging Ann Miller. Kant's now is her name. Kant's. Kant's. I can't. I can't do it. I can't. <laughs> anyway, they charge her with first degree murder. There you go. So the next day, Anne surrenders to police voluntarily. She's handcuffed, taken into custody, and then told she'll be held without bail. Right. Ha ha, Anne. So gotcha. in December of 2004, um, her attorney gets another hearing in front of the judge on bail. So the, the judge was like, okay, I'm going to set bail. $3 million. Oh, my golly. <laughs> so her ass sits in jail. Yeah. <laughs> so during the investigation, phone records reveal hundreds of calls between Ann and Daryl on the days leading up to Eric's death and about 24 calls between them while he was in the hospital. Oh, wow. Yep. And Willard's attorney revealed that Ann told Willard she gave Eric a large dose of arsenic through his IV while in the hospital. <gasps> See? Yep. God. Emails and texts between Ann and Daryl show a conspiracy between them to kill Eric. Daryl had, in fact, delivered a dose in Eric's beer at the bowling alley. Oh, my gosh. Ann had poisoned Eric's dinner and had delivered the dose in his IV. And, um... While they're investigating all of this, they also find a second affair Anne had had with a man in oh. California. Oh. I mean, floozy. She's a freaking floozy. Oh She's a poisonous God. floozy. Oh, my Lord, Anne. Yeah. Murderous, poisonous, highfalutin floozy. Floozy. Yeah. Now she's making NC State look bad. For heaven's sake. Yeah. In Raleigh. And I love those places. The nerve. I don't like her a bit. So, in court, so they go to court, and Anne, at the very last minute, cops a plea deal and pleads guilty to second-degree murder, right. which is stupid because second-degree murder, first degree is when it's premeditated. Right. Second degree is not premeditated. So, she's saying, I murdered him, but I didn't premeditate it, even though I continued to give him arsenic. Right, but Accidentally, that's, the, that's the plea. It that just they, makes me mad. They, they need, I know, but the attorneys need to stop it. They need to stop it. It's ridiculous already. So in court, so of course Eric's family is there in court. You know, they're listening to the whole situation. They're, they're going to court because they want to find out the details and what has really happened right. to Eric. And of course they get there and they get cheated out of that because floozy decides at the last minute to do a plea deal. So now right. they don't even get all the details. Oh my gosh. Right. 
So in court, her attorney read aloud an apology that Ann wrote to Eric's family. Oh, wait, I need to get my iPad because I'm going to read this to you because it is the lamest I'm sorry ever. Oh, my god! Like, this goes down in history as stupid. And I think the attorneys make them do that so that the judge will have show leniency because, because they show remorse. remorse. But she's not remorseful. This floozy. She's she just didn't, mad. She didn't get it. <laughs> she just didn't get it. So I'm going to go read this little sucker because she's stupid. So real quick, let me just throw yeah, in while I'm on, yeah. going through this recipe, the importance of making sure that you're using um, a garlic powder and not a garlic salt. Even though okay. you're using an unsalted butter, the salt comes from that um, old baked seasoning. Um, so you don't want to over salt. So please make sure garlic powder and not garlic salt. Because that would just ruin your biscuits. And you don't want to ruin your biscuits, which I've now got bacon in the oven. You should start to smell some amazing smells wafting through the air of my semi-packed yes, kitchen. Definitely. Okay, here is Anne's stupid ass note. All right. And I mean, if I were her attorney, I would have read it and then I would look there and said, "Really? This yeah. is what you came up this with? This is it? This is like the you best got you could do? Else to do in jail, but come up with something, and this is what you came up right. with?" Right. <laughs> She says, and I quote, for reasons I do not now understand, hmm. I permitted myself to knowingly participate with Daryl Willard in events which cost my husband's life. I wondered when she was going to put the blame on the poor. I will struggle not, not for the poor, rest of my life with how this could have happened. You dumb, stupid biatch. <laughs> it happened, it happened every you time you it. gave you arsenic. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So she says... I have asked God to forgive me, and I hope that God will also help those others whom I have hurt to find it in their hearts one day to forgive me as well. It's all about her. Oh, yeah. It's all about her. It's me, me, me. Yeah. And forgive that me. That was it. That was it. That was That's all. That's it? That was it. That's the big apology? That's the big fat apology. Oh, and. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the whole time her attorney read it, she kept her head down and did not face her ex in laws. <gasps> of course she didn't. No. Because she's a coward. So, now I have some statements from the family. Oh, I hope they tear her up. So. Interesting. I found a marble in my dishwasher that must have been stuck to the bottom of something. I don't know. Oh, I know. It's from a wine glass. Oh. There yes. Go. Oh, my gosh. All the things we find. All the things. Okay. So, from the prosecutor's table, Miller's family spoke of him as a loving man and an accomplished scientist. And then, um, one of his... No, his mother, Doris, says in a trembling voice, and you murdered my son. I have a hole in my heart and a pain in my chest every day. Oh. And still did not look up. And then her, his dad, his dad's name is Varus. Varus. I think it's Varus. It's V-E-R-U-S. All right. Varus. Varus. That's probably an old family name. I'm sure. And he, he starts showing pictures of his son during his happy times, Aww. and um, as he did that, Ann Miller, like, leaned over and started talking to one of her attorneys, like she was uninterested. Oh, for heaven's and sake. Then, and so then his dad all of a sudden goes, I wonder what Ann's favorite picture of Eric is. Oh, I've got an image in my mind. It's him laying in the hospital dead. <gasps> yeah, Ooh. he was not happy. So then his, Eric's older sister spoke. And she spoke very loudly, and then she started ranting. Anne, why don't you look at me? Why can't you look at me? And and Anne didn't look up. Why, Anne? Why did you, why did you cruelly murder my brother Eric? The only explanation I can find is the fact that there is pure evil in this world. The only one thing Ann Miller Cox is sorry for is that she got caught. Oh my gosh. So um, I hope the judge has taken notes. At this point, Anne broke down and started sobbing out loud. Which I think is just ridiculous because she's a jerk. And then um, one of Anne's, let's see, hold on. Oh, and then another sister of Eric started talking about um, Eric and Anne's daughter, who at that point was five years old, Claire. Oh. And she actually is being raised by one of Anne's sisters. 
But she said, I don't believe that you, Anne, truly love your daughter. How could you? You have taken away one of the most precious gifts that she will ever have, her father. And then McGee was holding her stomach with her fist and said, I will never understand why, Anne, you just didn't divorce him. You will get your punishment and death with eternity and hell. So after that, they all, they, they had their peace. They sat down and cried like a little bitch. And so Anne was given a sentence of 25 to 31 and a half years, which was the maximum sentence that she could get. Right, for second degree. Yes. And so um, after the court adjourned, Eric's family stuck around and talked to reporters, and Eric's dad compared Anne to Scott Peterson in California. There you go. And called her a narcissistic, evil psychopath. Oh, love it. Yes. Narcissistic, so, like evil, said, psychopath. He forgot the word bitch. Yes. <laughs> he forgot that word. He did. So, but I guess Burris is a better man than me because I, <laughs> I can't hold my tongue oh like my that. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Listen, she, it's, and it's not just about killing your husband when you should just go through the divorce proceedings. Yeah. And leave him. You've now taken away from the world a man who could have very easily found a cure for childhood cancer. Yeah, think about uh, all the children found, whose lives are potentially right, affected by this. Right, you've taken that away from the world. So, uh, thanks. And you've taken him away from his sweet daughter, Claire. Yes, whose life will forever be changed. Forever be oh changed. Oh, gosh. Yes. It's just so irritating. And it's, Let's go and smack her. Where is she? She's in Raleigh. Let's go. I love prison. Raleigh. I do, too. I love so I love any chance I get to go to Raleigh. We'll go, go to the original Tar Grill. Oh, my God. Now you're talking about love language again. <laughs> and then we'll head over to the prison and, and do we'll a little go. slap you in your face. And it won't be a slap and tickle. It'll just be a slap and slap. Uh, it'll be a slap and a kick. Yeah. And and I have bad words for her. I'm a, yes. I'm I'm gonna that are good for prison. Yes, you the words that you can't, you can't use out in public, but you yeah. can use them in prison. <laughs> yes. I'm using my prison language. I'm bringing my prison language, That's girl. right, exactly. You need exactly. to sit yourself down and listen. And not only that, but, you know, I mean, I understand that Daryl Willard was kind of a jackass, too, but he also took his life. Yeah, but that's the coward's way out. I he needed to face but his I, punishment. You're exactly right, but I fault Anne for that. She, I mean, I fault Anne for all of this. She was fooling around with Willard Dillard, whatever freaking hell his name was, and through that, he got caught up in her scheme. I don't think she got caught up in his scheme. Right. Because the, She planted the seed. and She planted the seed. Right. And I think because he's her supervisor, he probably helped her order that crap. And he was and signed thinking with his down below. He was thinking with his down below. Yes. Yes, which happens a lot. And then he but then couldn't he, get enough oxygen to his brain. And, and he then he shot himself. Decisions. So then he leaves his wife and his two kids to clean up after his mess. And then those two kids have to learn that their dad not only cowardly took his own life, but also killed was trying to kill a man. Right. Now they got to live with that. Right. And so they can never be friends with Claire. Right. Never. Well, they could. No, there are some people that can can put that. I just don't see it happening. No, it I would don't. be very difficult. But there are some people who can rise above better than you and me. Oh yeah, there are much better people than us. <laughs> we are we are low down when it comes to that. We yeah. can't just walk away. We it's hard. It. It's hard to let it go. It's hard to let it go. And even when people say they let it go, they I don't, don't let it go. I don't believe them. I think they're either medicated or under a lot of daily therapy. <laughs> yes, that's the only reason that they're letting it go. <laughs> So anyway, that was my murder. I that thought it was an interesting, interesting. one because it was a poisoning and it was done by a chemist and she's a jackass. I yeah. don't like her at all. And her name is Anne, but like I said, not with the E, so completely different. Yeah, show. no, I didn't, I didn't even, even get like a similar vibe. No, or I didn't even think about a similar anything because yeah. what I mean you drop off the E and it's a whole different personality. Yeah. As you can see. So you're starting to smell that oh good. God, it smells so good. It smell. makes me want shrimp and crab cakes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're not I getting need that some here. Food in my life. You're not getting that here. No, I'm not. So we've got um, like 40 seconds left on them for the first little batch. So well, this port. is a good time for us to take a quick pause. Okay. So I can get them out of the oven, start a new batch, and get started on my story. All right. And we're pausing. All right. We're back. We're back. And we're back. And we're back. And I don't need that. <laughs> you looked like you were going to say something like big. Oh I my. thought I was, and then 
I didn't know what it was that I was going to say. Whatever. We're back. It's okay. We're back. All right. Now I'm going to talk about my story. I'm excited. Yes. Oh, and look. Oh, Trout's got his toy. I'm so excited to see you. Yeah. He doesn't like him when I sit down and I don't hold him. Something else as of late that he started is he gets really upset if I sit in my chair without a blanket. Oh, he's then like, this he's is not like, the deal. right. And he'll, it took me a while to figure out what the heck was the problem. Yeah. I thought, do you need to go out? You've got food, you've eaten, like everything. And then the only thing I can think of is he doesn't have a blanket. So I get a blanket and then he doesn't make another noise. Oh, is she telling a story? Yes. You're spoiled rotten, dude. Yeah. You don't even know you're a dog. Yeah. He's a cat dog. He's cat dog. Okay, here we go. And August 6th, 1977. Oh, wow. 1977. A young couple is getting frisky in the car when they're killed with no warning. How did you know? Don't, don't, don't. How did you it's know? It's the beginning of a whole, every horror story from That's the 70s true. that you've ever seen. That's very true. Shortly after, another couple is killed. And why what do is happening? Make out with their doors locked. Whatever happened to that? I think their door was locked. Well, now I don't know. How did it happen then? Shotgun. <gasps> mm -hmm. oh, I, mm -hmm. I thought it was a hook. Yeah, yeah. The hook. It was the hook. Oh no, not the hook. It was the hook. <laughs> so, you know, police were like, "Uh oh, we might have a serial killer on our hands," but they can never figure out who did it. They didn't, they just didn't know. Who done it? Right. So now we're going to have pop ahead a little bit. <laughs> we're hipping ahead. In Jefferson County, Wisconsin. Wisconsin? Yeah. Yeah. So Jefferson County is a rural community of about 85,000 people. Okay. It's out in the country. Um, and there's this little place out in the boondocks where people like to hold special events. Like oh. for us, it would have been the Coon Hunters Club. Oh, okay. Only bigger and maybe a titch nicer. Like it didn't have all of the dead animals in Don't it. Judge. Right. I'm not judging. I'm just saying it didn't have the dead animals kind in it. Kind of like where our friends had their wedding, like at a that little lake house thing that they. No, that not event. not quite not, that fancy. Not that nice. <laughs> no, so this is that and the a titch above. above, like just a titch, right? Just okay. a little. We're just above. taking the animals off the wall. Exactly. Okay. So it was a lovely place called the Concord House. August 9th, 1980. So we're, we've jumped ahead to 1980. That's three years. There's two weddings going on. Two at once. How did they do that? I know. It was a big place, but I don't know. I wouldn't like that. I wouldn't either. So, so there's a special young, day. Right. There's a young couple at one of the weddings, and their names are Tim Hack and Kelly Drew. So Tim and Kelly are 19, and they're high school sweethearts. After the wedding reception, Tim and Kelly leave to go home, but they never show up at home. Uh -oh. And the next day, Tim's father finds Tim's car still parked at the Concord house. Tim's wallet was on, in the car, and his dad tested the car to check to see if there were any mechanical issues, and it was running just fine. Oh, no. So Tim's dad is like, dude, there's definitely something going on here because Tim always calls. Now, in the 80s, there's no cell phone. No. But we still managed to call our parents from a payphone if we weren't going to be home. Absolutely. And Tim was not one to just not show up. So Tim's dad calls the police, and the police start looking for Tim and Kelly. Not quite sure why Kelly's parents didn't pop up, but anyway. They, did. they don't like her very much. Maybe. They probably had a lot of kids, and they were just like, one down, we're good. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, as part of the investigation, they interview the people that may have seen the couple the night before, and they follow up on every lead they could. The, co the community was in a panic because they had this young couple in 1977 that got yeah. murdered, another couple got murdered, and now this couple is missing, and they're like, what is happening? So, um, five days after Tim and Kelly disappeared... And three miles from the Concord House, police find Kelly's bra and underwear <gasps> along, along the road. Oh, no. They also find Tim's shirt and some pieces of rope along that same road. What the heck? But they didn't find the bodies. Oh, this is not Two well. months after the disappearance, some squirrel hunters find Kelly's body. Um, and that same day, along the same path, they find Tim's body. 
So Kelly Drew had been raped and strangled to death, and Tim had been stabbed to death. Even after the extensive investigation, the case, which they now, which they called the Sweetheart Murders, goes cold. Oh, wow. So they, they had no idea. Was that the timer? No, it was uh, my phone notifying me of something important. I'm sure, like, oh, my God, I'm going to run out of battery soon, lady. Or it might rain. Yeah, it's like, oh, we've got 5% left. Life is going to end. It's really not. All right, so now we're hopping ahead to 2007. So those those all were unsolved? Unsolved. Cold cases. Didn't have a clue. Dang. Right. So, um, but they did their whole crime scene investigation, and they did have um, some evidence that they saved. So okay. that's that's good. Right, but back then they didn't have the kind of testing that they do. No, they collected later it was and, amazing because cops back then collected evidence that they knew they couldn't test, mm -hmm. but they just collected it just in case something came up. They were very smart. So they were. It's like they could see into the future. Yeah. So in two thousand seven, um, Wisconsin is given a grant to open to go and open some old cold case files and see if they can figure out what's happening. So they've yeah, got money. And I think DNA testing has come along. Right. And I guess they, you know, the state said, okay, we've got these cold cases. Yeah. We're going to put it out there and see um, what happens. Is that the, that is, is the timer. timer. Yeah. I'm going to hop down off my Hop down off your, off your stool, lady. Mm -hmm. So they're given, the investigators are, are given the go ahead to re-examine the sweetheart murders. Um, they were able to obtain some DNA from semen on Kelly's underwear, and they sent the sample off to the lab. In 2009, the Wisconsin police release a statement to the community about the case, and they ask for any information that anybody might have that could help them solve the murder. Um, they smell so good. They do smell good. Oh. <laughs> So, um, April Balasio is on her computer, and she happens to see the request for the information about the Sweetheart Murders case. She's reading the statement, and then chills. Uh-oh, you didn't turn the timer off. So that's going to be annoying. So, <laughs> so, she's reading the statement, and then chills start to run up her spine. She oh. slams her laptop closed and realizes she knows the killer. What? I know, oh my God. Okay, oh. so this is so, so tell me who this person is again. I haven't said a word about her yet, only her name, April. April. But she was a police officer? No, she's just a lady looking at her laptop. She's reading she's, and the news pops up uh, and with, she's like, okay, Wisconsin's got money. There's some cold cases. Oh, uh, let me read about this. And then she starts reading it. She's like, holy crap. I think I know who did it. I know who did it. Man. So she is the oldest daughter of five children. Mm -hmm. Her father was Edward Edwards. Ed Edwards. Oh, again with the uncreative <laughs> parents. Come on, people. Come on. Ed Edwards. Eddie Edwards. Um, and her mother, her mother's name is Kay. Kay Edwards. April's father, Ed, was an overnight success after releasing an autobiographical book called Metamorphosis of a Killer, The True Life, um, the true life Story of Ed Edwards, which detailed his life as a reformed, excuse me, turning page, criminal. <laughs> so this was her daddy? Her daddy, yeah. He had served 17 years in prisons in prison for a bank robbery and he became um, changed in prison and he got out, he wrote a book and he became a motivational speaker. His book was called what? Metamorphosis of a Killer, The True Story of Ed Edwards. Um, yeah, so motivational speaker, very popular, made tons of money. Uh, he was even a guest on that TV show to tell the truth. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the real Ed Edwards stand Please up. Stand right. Up. 
Unfortunately, his fame and financial sex success became sex. sex. No, no, there was no, there was financial no, sex? no okay. success. Success. Yeah, it came to an end. Oh. You know, um, it can't last forever. What goes up must come down. Th that's right. Luckily, Ed had picked up some carpentry skills while he was in prison. <laughs> well, I mean, who doesn't? So he was able to get some jobs and and was able to keep the family afloat. Okay. You know, and that's a big family if you've got yeah. five kids, so seven of you. Um, by 1974, Ed has managed to scrape enough money together to buy a house for his family in Ohio. Ohio! Ohio. He and Kay work hard to get the house ready. They got to do some renovations. It's a fixer-upper. He didn't have a lot of money. And Ed befriends the police in that community. And he uses his charm and outgoing personality to pick up details on crime in his community. And then he passes that information over to the police. So the next thing you know, Ed's a got, snitch. Ed turns into a, sti a snitch. He becomes, becomes an informant for the police department. So it wasn't unusual to see the police and detectives at Ed's house. April remembers that because of Ed's relationship with the police, there were people that were very unhappy with Ed. She recalls a night when someone set fire to their set their house on fire. Oh, wow. The family had been at the movies, thankfully, and an investigation found that arson had caused the fire. So they knew somebody had oh, set the fire. Yeah. So Ed and Kay decide that they've got to move the family for their safety. And Ed actually moves his family um, to a new state every six months to keep them safe from these bad people. Is one of those states Wisconsin? <sighs> the family constantly thinks they're in danger. And April remembers when Ed was building the family's second house, her dad befriended a young man, um, and he, this guy was helping him build the house. But something happened to the guy and he stopped showing up. So um, Ed got scared that one of the bad people had gotten him and he actually sold the house unfinished and moved his family to Florida. He was like, mm, we're out of here. Wow. They're, they've gotten to him trying to get to me. They did that in the middle of the night, by the way. So from Florida, they moved to Wisconsin. <laughs> after land of the cheese. Land of the cheese. So after a short period of time, Ed comes home one night and he's got a black eye, a cut on his nose, and is visibly shaken. Again, for his family safety, he moves them in the middle of the night. Wow. So now it's nineteen eighty two. Yes. Now it's nineteen eighty two and the family settles in Slippery Rock, Pennsylvania. There is an accident and Kay ends up in the hospital. Oh no. And while Kay is recovering in the hospital, Ed decides to take the kids on a camping trip. Well, wouldn't you know? While everyone's away from the house, the darn thing burns to the ground. Again? Again. Damn it. Oh my gosh, these people have the worst luck. I know. It's awful. Once again, investigators come in and they figure out it was arson. Um, good news, though. The criminals came forward and confessed to the arson. They did? They did. It turns out that Ed had gotten his three young sons to burn the house down. Excuse me? So that he could... While they were camping? Collect the insurance money. What? I mean... Bless his heart for not burning the whole family up in the house. Well, thank you for that, Ed. So. Um, I just want to know what kind of an accident Kay had. Right. Ed says, um, no, it, it, it wasn't, it, we, it wasn't them. They, it wasn't them. They don't know what they're saying. <laughs> he says, I, I burned it down. I burned the house down in an effort to protect my family from whoever's after him. Okay. And he needed the money to escape. He said, we've, we've had to move and I needed the money. So I burn the house down. But can I just point out something yeah. that's really that people don't realize and that people are stupid? Right. Your house burns down. Mm -hmm. They don't just give you a check the next day. Well, maybe they did back then because it seems did. to be working for him. He's got the system going. <laughs> this is the second house that he's he found the insurance company. He's burned. Like, uh, excuse me. Excuse me. So Ed was arrested and sentenced to two years. He gets out of prison. He comes back to the family. 
But April didn't trust her dad anymore. She's like, I can't believe that you had those boys set that fire. Yeah. And she's old enough now, and she moves out. So she's like, I'm out of here. Good for her. Yeah, go April. By 1987, Ed was focusing on his other four children, who were top-notch athletes. Um, he even takes, um, takes in a friend of the kids named Danny. Danny was in and out of foster homes, and he needed a place to stay, and Ed and Danny became really close, so Danny stayed with them at, at the Edwards house. Um, Danny even, so Danny was too old to be adopted, mm -hmm. but he did change his name to okay. Danny Boy Edwards. Danny Boy? Danny Boy. Danny Boy Edwards. Hello, of course you, Karen girl. <laughs> Why, don't, why are you asking oh, these? Oh, Danny Boy. <laughs> yes. This is out like an Irish wake song. Right. So, Danny Boy Edwards. So Stop saying that name. That's the dumbest <laughs> name. Okay, well, then Danny Boy. Why don't you call, why don't you name your dog Trout Dog? Trout Dog, because he's not a dog. Trout Cat Dog. I don't know what I would call him. I don't either. <laughs> That's a bad example. So, after high school, Ed says, you know, Danny, I think the best thing for you to do is go into the military. Because you get some really good benefits. So Danny's like, all right, I'm going to go into the military. And after basic training, um, Danny hurts his ankle. And he's about to be medically discharged. Oh, no. But he goes AWOL two days before his medical discharge. Well, that's dumb. And Danny Boy disappears. Ooh. About a year later, some hunters discover a shallow <gasps> grave behind a no. cemetery. A week after finding the remains... Page turn. The <laughs> coroner confirms that they are that of Danny. Boy. Stop saying boy. <laughs> His cause of death was a gunshot uh, to the back of the head. No, that's so rude. I know. And when police tell Ed, he is devastated. He tells the police that he will do anything to help find Danny Boy's killer. He becomes obsessed with it. He cuts out articles. He goes to church and... and tells people about it and asks people questions. He's determined he's going to find out who killed Danny Boy. Mm. And the case goes cold. Aww. I know. Years later, all five of Edward's children are hanging out. Much like I would think, you know, maybe it's Thanksgiving or whatever. And yeah. our parents have gone to bed and we're all sitting around the table talking about stories from our past. So they start talking about Danny Boy and some things, other things from their childhood. And they start to talk about when their mother, Kay, was in the hospital. One of the older siblings reveals that the reason Kay was in the hospital was because Ed had stabbed her. <gasps> the younger kids didn't, didn't know that. Yeah. They just, right. So um, evidently, Ed had come home from work, and he got pissed off because the bag of chips that he wanted to eat was gone. It, so it was like half a bag of chips, and evidently the boys had gone and eaten them I know at some I point. I've, I've gone to get some chips, and they're gone, and I do want to stab somebody, but the <laughs> difference is I don't. Yeah. So, yeah, he becomes really, really irate and pissed. And, and stabs the mama who probably didn't have the first chip out of that bag. <laughs> probably not. No. No, no she's the one who went to the supermarket chip. to buy the damn chips. Right. She's the last <laughs> person that he should have stabbed. So April and her sister are just completely shocked. And the kids start to wonder if their father was a monster. It sounds like something's up with well, Ed, Ed Edwards. Ed Edwards, I mean, yeah. naming that, he's doomed. Doomed. So then April kind of becomes obsessed, and she starts to really look around at old case, cold case files, trying to find a link to her father. So she's like, you know, I'm going to go back and look at things that happen in all of the states that we lived in that are cold cases and see if anything rings a bell. Ding -a -ling -a -ling. Right. That's when she sees the article about the sweetheart murders cold case in Wisconsin. That's also when she remembers that her father, Ed, worked at the Colton house. He was the handyman at the Colton house in the 80s. Oh, and my gosh. That's what she did. Oh, Shh. my God. Then Shut she flashes back to the night her father came home beaten up. Yeah. She remembers that her father talked obsessively about the murders. So April calls the number in the article and tells them that she thinks her father might be the killer. Oh, my heavens. Yeah. Can you imagine having to make that phone No, call? I just got chills even thinking about yeah. it. Yeah. So Ed had been investigated 
but was released. They had um, asked him some questions, and he said, you know, I'm just the handyman. I, I know was, nothing. Right, right, right. So the detective... I just had a whole shed full of rakes and shovels and things to cut the grass with, and yeah, that's me, but I don't know nothing. <laughs> I don't know nothing. <laughs> so the detective that's handling the case starts to dig around for more information on Ed and comes across Ed's book, Metamorphosis of a Killer. I don't think he metamorphosis. He starts reading the book and red flags start going off. In the book, Ed talks about his mental health and he talks about dominating women. He talks about his obsession with young brunette women. Kelly Drew was a brunette, by the way. So detectives say, uh, we got to figure out where this old Ed is. So oh this, remember, this happened in 2000. So 1977 was that first couple. Mm -hmm. And then 1980 was um, Kelly and Tim. And um, then you got Danny. Boy. And Yeah. <laughs> So, Ed, he's he's no spring chicken, just saying. But they, they track him down. He and Kay, he and Kay are still together. Well, that's dumb on her part. And they're living in a trailer park in, Louis, in Louisville, Kentucky. Ed is over 75, and he is in very poor health. But the detectives start asking him questions about his time at the Concord House. Um, they ask Ed for DNA, and Ed says, uh, no. I don't trust the police with my DNA. Why? I'm not just going to clone somebody. Not going to just, gonna like just hand over my DNA. So of you. Right. Um, but the detectives were one step ahead of him because they brought a search warrant that said, you have to give us your DNA. Uh -huh. So they get his DNA and um, they send it off to the lab. And when you know, it is a perfect match for the DNA found on Kelly Drew's underwear. Ew. So, and you're a creep on top of that. I know. So they charge Ed with Kelly and Tim's murders. And then they throw him in jail. He's extradited to Wisconsin. And at this time, Man Ed decides chance. that he doesn't want to spend the rest of his days in jail. So he requests the death penalty. I don't think you should just be able to request that. Well, Wisconsin didn't have the death penalty at that time. So there, you dumbass. So Ed says, well, okay then. Let me tell you about something that happened in Ohio. Ohio. Remember the kid that was helping Ed build the house in Ohio? And then he stopped showing up? His name was Billy. Was it Billy Boy? No. Just <laughs> Billy. No. Just that would have been so I amazing. Know. Oh, my God. Can you imagine if they called him Billy Boy? Oh, my. They probably did. Yes. Danny Boy Billy and Billy Boy. Boy and uh, Billy was around... The Edwards family a lot. Like, he hung out with them. Yeah. He ate dinner with them and stuff. And Ed gets the idea that Billy has taken a real liking to a very young April. And Ed has convinced himself that Billy has molested April. So, he tells Billy that if he touches any of his, one of his kids, that he's going to kill him. So, one night, Ed sees Billy's Billy. like, dude, that's fine. Right. Because I don't, I don't want to. Right. And there's no indication, like, April hasn't come out and said, I've been molested. There's absolutely nothing that would say, he's except for his, He's right. projecting his evilness onto somebody right. else. So, um, Ed sees Billy and his girlfriend out at a bar one night, and he follows the two lovers to Lover's Lane. He walks up to the car with a shotgun, and the date is August 6, 1977. And we just solved that murder. Ed shoots both Billy and his girlfriend. There was no indication that Billy had ever done anything to, to April. No, so, he's dead on his girlfriend. He's not interested in your right. children. Why don't you just walk away? Right. You see him with the girlfriend and you're like, dude, my mistake. Right. Yeah. So, no. Instead, he just blows their heads off. Oh. So, now Ed has confessed to killing Billy and his girlfriend back in 1977. So, he's like, give me the death penalty. Well, no can do, because wouldn't you know, they didn't have the death penalty. In Ohio? In 1977. <laughs> oh, my God. This man is an idiot. <laughs> he did not metamorphosis to anything but an idiot. <laughs> no. So, um, oh, my gosh. He now, now, he's, now he's got four murder charges <laughs> and, and no, no death, death penalty. penalty. Right. He is not the But Ed old. really, really wants the death penalty. So he says, well, 
Let me tell you something that happened um, oh my to my foster son, Danny boy. Danny boy. I know. When Danny um, entered the military, he was given a life insurance policy oh, through the military. God. And Ed convinced Danny to pay extra money to get the maximum benefit. <gasps> and, of course, made Ed the beneficiary. Of course. So, Ed was planning to kill Danny at the end of boot camp. Like, okay. And then see what, what was going to happen is he got done with his training boot camp and then he was supposed to be deployed. Yeah. And, but he hurt himself. Yes. So instead of being deployed, he was going to be medically discharged, which then would he was going to lose, the life, lose the life insurance. Right. So, um, Ed says, Danny, you're going to, you're going to lose this life insurance. You need to get away from these people. So they can't medically discharge. You need to go AWOL. Oh, that's I'll I meet you and get you what you need oh, so you can get away. Back. So then while they're together um, talking about their plan, Ed says, hey, Danny, can you reach in your bag and get me a cigarette? And when Danny bends over to get the cigarette out of his bag for Ed, he shoots him in the back of the head. What an asshole. And Ed got $250,000 <sighs> uh, from Danny's life insurance. So um, finally... Ed get what, gets what he wants. He is convicted of that murder and sentenced to die by a lethal injection. Oh, my gosh. Finally gets what he wants. However, in August of, 2000, <laughs> of 2010, one month before his schedule to be executed, Ed dies of natural causes. Oh, my gosh. Ha! He got the death Can't always get anyway. what you want, buddy. That's right. Be careful what you ask for, you douche canoe. So his daughter, April, still believes that there are more people out Absolutely. there that, that he killed. Um Absolutely. But yeah, what an idiot. Oh my gosh. That is the story of Ed Edwards, metamorphosis of a freaking killer. And I'm going to tell you something. When you call your son Edward Edwards, right. you are, you've written it in the universe that he is a serial killer. <laughs> and I want to, so he, he went to, he went to jail the first time on bank robbery charges. Right. But his book was called Metamorphosis of a Killer. Right. Which it should have been Metamorphosis of a Bank Robber. Right. So he told on himself to begin In with. the very beginning. And yes. people thought he was amazing because he had turned his life around he and all this other stuff. He's just collecting your money. Right. Right, right. <sighs> well, I'll be damned. Yeah. So there you go. There That's you what we it. got. All right. Go grab us a biscuit. I'm, I'm on do these. It. I'm going to do it. Ah, uh, hungies, a hungies, a hungies. Get you a biscuit. Get me a biscuit, please, and I'll have some shrimps with it. I ain't got no shrimps. I know, but I want trunks. All right, so, and I only have paper plates, so you're good. How about just a paper you towel? You don't even need a paper plate. I'm just going to put yeah. it on a I don't care. paper towel. Since when have we needed any kind of a fancy There's that. Thank you. Check mm. bay biscuits. This smell is just unbelievable. Yeah, it is. Okay, mm. here we go. Mm -hmm. Oh, that is delicious. Whoa. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think it's so much better than what you would get in a box. Oh, me too. But it's just so easy to whip that stuff up. That is so good. The, it's just enough Old Bay mm -hmm. to just tell you it's some Old Bay in mm -hmm. it. But the butter married with the cheese. Yes. Mm -mm -mm. And then the parsley on top. is amazing. It's really, really good, Shelby. You did so good. Thank you. Oh, I will have a steak with this now. Thanks. <sighs> That's a great idea. Great idea. Let's go get a steak. And some asparagus. Okie doke. Okay. All right. Well, listen, you guys, enjoy the rest of your week. Stay sweet. Stay safe. Wash your freaking hands. Wear a mask if that's what you're being told to do. Don't yeah. be an idiot. Don't be an asshole. Yeah. Just keep Just everyone safe. Be safe. Be good. Be sweet. And be back here next week. Wash your hands. All right. Love y'all. Bye. Bye now. Thank you for listening to Believe. You can show support to your host by subscribing to the show and giving us a five-star rating on your preferred platform. Check us out at Believe.com and search for B-L-E-A-V on YouTube.